Coming to you from UBN Studios in Burbank, California. You're listening to the Unsugarcoated Podcast with your host, Ali Alanius. Hello, 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 and welcome back to another episode of your favorite social good podcast. I am your host, Ali, and I'm so happy to be here. I have uh, another treat for you, as always. I love all my guests. They are all incredible people. The one in particular is uh, someone who we are going to be releasing an upcoming social good short on as well, in addition to the podcast. And I'm actually happy because this is a person who does deserve a whole podcast, maybe a series, but we will talk about that later. Um, and in going into those social shorts, I do want to give people, you know, kind of let people know. I mean, I come on here and we have these incredible conversations. And when I can have the opportunity to share with you what Unsugarcoated Media, the nonprofit media production company, is doing behind the scenes, we are getting ready to roll out a series of social good shorts. What those are focused on are five minute content videos that bring you an empowering person, a story of triumph, and furthermore, a call to action. And all of these individuals are, you know, like I said, they could get a whole series, but the way that kind of content is working these days, five minute shorts is what a lot of people are looking for. So we are very interested in uh, producing a series that do that, that feed people, but also feed their soul, feed their mind, humanize one another, and ultimately creating more empathy. Our goal with Unsugar Coded Media is always to end isolation, build community, and you know bridge those bridges that need to be for the goodness of humanity. So with that, I'm excited to bring this person today because he is somebody who has an incredible story and very much is aligned with our vision. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get to it. As the CEO of Starlight Runner, Jeff Comez has worked with the Walt Disney Company, Pirates of the Caribbean, Fairies, Tron Legacy. He's worked with 20th Century Fox on James Cameron's Avatar, Sony Pictures Entertainment, Men in Black 3, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Mattel, Hot Wheels Animation Universe, Showtime's Dexter, Hasbro's Transformers, Nickelodeon's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, just to name a few, and others. Gomez is a writer and transmedia producer and well-recognized for his contributions towards shifting the business and artistic paradigm in the global film and entertainment industry. Designated a Hollywood power player by Variety in January 2012, he's been awarded the Director's Coin for Excellence by the United States Special Operations Command Interagency Task Force for his transmedia work on asymmetrical conflict and international crisis narrative in the field. In the U.S., Gomez champions the concerns of young people with his Never Surrender inspirational sur seminars and curricula. And here to talk to us today about the modality of reconciliation and his incredible life's journey. Please, everyone, welcome Mr. Jeff Gomez. How are you, Jeff? Well, thank you so much, Aaliyah. What an introduction, my gosh. <laughs> I've well, lived a long life. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and honestly, that's so short. That's really short in comparison to all the wonderful, incredible things that you do. And, you know, I want to kind of start off with, you know, going over a little bit. You're, you're from New York. You were born into a very interesting situation. I, I will let you tell truly the story, but I know you ha you were born to a 15-year-old uh, young unwed woman, young girl in New York during a time when that really wasn't, you know, accepted. And, you know, kind of just start with, I mean, where were you born, Jeff Gomez? Tell us, start with that. Sure. Um, uh, my mom was uh, uh, from the north side of, of Houston Street in Alphabet City. My dad was from the south side of Houston Street in the Lower East Side, uh, the Baruch Projects. And um, uh, yeah, I was an accident. <laughs> and, um, and my mom uh, had to leave home uh, because uh, it was just, you know, uh, too scandalous to, to be pregnant at such a young age at that time. And I was born uh, in a, a woman's shelter uh, on Staten Island. Um, uh, it was a difficult birth. Uh, the forcep delivery uh, paralyzed uh, the left side of my face, um, uh, uh, giving me a kind of crooked smile. Um, uh, so uh, there was a lot kind of riding against me. I was a little Puerto Rican kid uh, who was essentially homeless and, and put into foster care uh, uh, from a, a teenage girl 
who the odds were against uh, in, in this world uh, very much so. You, I know that you shared with me, now that initial transition was good. I mean, you ended up in a, in, a, in a good foster family for the first few years of your life. And then you were suddenly taken back to your mother. Your mother came back and she took you back. And so your life kind of went from, as I know, as I know and I'm, I'm, you know, again, I don't want to tell your story, but I mean, I know that you went from this very loving family to suddenly a different environment. What was that new environment like for you? Well, um, uh, I was th those first couple of years. Yeah, was a, a kind of a quiet, serene, uh, upstate New York uh, environment. The white picket fence, the doggies, <laughs> uh, lots of, of, of foster brothers and sisters. It was and and my inclination to uh, be curious and to read and to uh, be a, a kind of little miniature storyteller was was being uh, promoted. Uh, when I went back to uh, New York City and, and my mom looked, she loved me, so she wanted me back and convinced uh, uh, Jose <laughs> to, to take me back. Uh, he was uh, Afro-Latino and, and uh, uh, we were united as a family in, in his parents' home. So suddenly I was uh, thrown into this kind of highly chaotic uh, environment, uh, which was super high masculine, and um, and so I was seen as somebody, you know, a very, kind of almost like a little alien, um, you know, uh, to to read, to uh, uh, to be into studying little things like dinosaurs and and fairy tales and mythology and and, and things like that. For a, a three-year-old, that wasn't just a, a strange; that was actually a little bit feminine uh, uh, to them. And so um, I, I automatically started to encounter friction. Uh, I was also upset because my environment has changed so much. So, um, you know, the, the, the discipline that they asserted on me was a, a, a little bit physical, which, um, which was really kind of rough for a kid like me, very sensitive kid. I mean, do you have any memories? Of, like, what, what did you do with that? Did you, you know, in, did you become more introverted? Did you, did you change? How did your behavior change as your environment changed? Uh, Aliyah, frankly, um, uh, I, I got scared. You know, uh, the world became a scary place. Um, uh, so, um, one thing that I did to to kind of uh, protect myself was to kind of check. You know, who's going to tease me? Who's going to make fun of me? Who can who can hit me? And I'm not talking about just the family. I'm talking about the the this strange neighborhood that I suddenly found myself in. Um, uh, it was violent. It, it was, um, it, you know, uh, not always fun. Um, the other thing that I did was I started to, um, uh, you know, tell myself stories to kind of protect myself and, and create a little bubble in my, my bedroom where whatever toys, whatever little objects I could find would get integrated into kind of this fantasy world um, uh, that, um, that kind of soothed me and allowed me to get lost in, in a uh, world of imagination. Mm. How did your family feel about you getting lost in imagination when you were younger? Oh, uh, <laughs> one of the words that was used uh, uh, by, by some of the grown-ups uh, uh, near me uh, included um, uh, defecto. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. uh, you know, they, they thought it was, um, uh, you know, uh, effeminate, uh, uh, flojo, it was another word that they, they used. Um, you know, they, they thought it was weird and, um, and often tried to cajole me into, um, uh, you know, being more overt, being more uh, uh, socially connected uh, and embracing uh, my, you know, Latino roots, speaking Spanish and things like that. And of course, uh, I was rejecting those things because it, it was just too intense and uh, uh, too aggressive for me. Right, right. So you got older and you, you know, so you had this home environment and I know you touched a little bit, but let's just kind of move forward. Now you're, you're getting older, you're a teenager, you, you, you've become, you know, you, you've somewhat become accustomed to the environment now and you're going to school and you're dealing with people that are also picking on you pointing out your differences, ridiculing you, and bullying you. 
how how did that how did those experiences shape you what were they like first of all and then how did they end up also continue shaping you um yeah yeah you know it was um it was rough because uh, for for some kids who experience chaos in their homes uh, school is almost like a uh, you know like a protective zone right um uh, but for me uh, it wasn't uh, a school was rough um uh, there were there were a lot of young people who in retrospect themselves were were um you know victimized or um you know exposed to extraordinary aggression um and um and so of course they took out those hostilities on anything that they perceived was different and boy was i different <laughs> um uh, so you, you know um uh, people would make faces trying to imitate you know my my uh, my mouth or the fact that i squinted because uh, one eye was you know sort of uh, uh, there was a paralysis in the other eye you know squinted against the sun and um uh you know uh, they'd um they they'd call me names uh, you know um in, in the early going uh, a fag was used a lot uh, later, when we moved to uh, to Flushing, Queens, which was like the countryside <laughs> compared to uh, the city, my mom uh, took me and my sister out to Flushing. Um, uh, you know, uh, then my ethnicity got attacked, so I was the spick. You know, um, uh, there were, um, uh, you know, there there were the jets and the sharks from West Side Story, and I find I found myself a shark, so I got kind of beat up a lot. <laughs> um, so I had to start to develop uh, some defense mechanisms because this was, you know, I, I was deeply unhappy. What were some of those defense mechanisms? Well, um, uh, you know, who was there to, to help me? Not many people, but I, I did read a lot of books and I watched a lot of TV shows and, and movies. So um, my teachers became um, uh, Sherlock Holmes, Captain Kirk, <laughs> Gandalf uh, from, from the Lord of the Rings, you know, Spider-Man, um, uh, you know, and, and, um, and somehow I got it into my head that if I embraced their, their values, if I embraced um, uh, the, some of their little uh, mental strategies, that, that somehow I could um, uh, succeed a little bit more. And, um, uh, and, and so the, the first uh, uh, kind of strategy that I started to develop was what I call uh, these days threshold assessment, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you walk to the threshold of any new room that's filled with people and, um, and you scan it and, and look at the behavior of each and every person as quickly as possible. It's, it's sort of like um, uh, Neo looking at the matrix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and what I realized was that uh, there were some people who were more repellent. Um, uh, they were more aggressive. Um, uh, they could be nastier. Uh, people tended to avoid them more. So I would figure out what the location was of the bullies, uh, of the people who might uh, mock me or, or, or cause me some kind of harm. And I was able to navigate a little further away from those uh, from those people. Um, the 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 second um, uh, kind of strategy was uh, that um, that I began to to kind of observe those bullies. I began to observe these kind of antisocial kids, and came to realize that um, you know every single day that they entered the classroom or entered the schoolyard everybody would treat them exactly the same way. There was an instant expectation that something was going to be uh, problematic. And, and there was a kind of micro expression on these kids' faces. You know, they'd walk through the door with a, a degree of hope. And of course, everyone played into the expectation that there was going to be a problem, that something was going to be wrong. And I would see that they were... Um, uh, disappointed that they were um, uh, not happy with with the day from the get go, 
even the teachers would would have this little expression uh, you know the bullies entering the room and i actually I, I felt for them a little bit because i knew how that felt from home right. <laughs> essentially so um uh, i began to to try and listen to them and and gauge their interests and 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 figure out what um what would engage them and what i realized Aaliyah, was that um they were often interested in some of the same things I was. You know, a couple of them liked dinosaurs. A couple of them watched the Godzilla movie. Some of them liked motorcycles and, and race cars. And I wasn't as into those sorts of things, but I would, I would brush up on those subjects so that occasionally I could toss a little, a little line about them to the, the bully. And, and at first there was a standoffishness, but they would realize that I was listening to them. Mm. And Aliyah, that was the key, the key to everything. And the key basically to all the success that I've had since. When you listen to an individual, genuinely and authentically listen, you start to um, um, uh, get their attention and, and they come to value you because nobody listens to anybody yeah right no i agree <laughs> Leah, think of think of the the people in your life who uh, are so interested in what you have to say that they won't start making up something in their head while you're talking <laughs> that that they actually really are authentically listening to you right you could probably count them on one hand maybe two <laughs> and i'll bet you value those people Yes, I do. And I think it's very interesting because when you talk about it, we, we've talked about this before and, and it's kind of segueing a little bit into the conversation about how, how, you know, how your journey, it's, it's been very interesting to me how you, you stand out as somebody who we have empathy for, for what you've gone through at the same token, so proud of the person that you've become regardless and in the face of those, but also how you've genuinely developed a care for people that did at once upon, you know, really did target you. And, and I think that when we, we talked about the recent um, series, Cobra Kai, Cobra Kai did that so amazingly, like when you got the back end picture, right? So for people who haven't, I mean, spoiler alert, just a little bit, but <laughs> Cobra Kai, it takes the, you know, Danny's son from, Daniel's son from Karate Kid, which we all loved and felt sorry for, and then they expand. They go into the backstory, and suddenly Johnny is not this evil villain that you think he is, but he just was being bullied at home. And you get more into the layers of the why, right? Why do people behave? And I love that you're very passionate about going and giving the people who are often marginalized because bullies bullies and i'm putting you know when they which which bullying is a real thing people do bully others and i'm never trying to dismiss that i mean my own children have been bullied i know i've been bullied in my life though at this point in my life i dare someone to try and bully me but you know the reality is that does exist but i will say whenever i have come up with those i always want to know but why you know when my kids tell me about how somebody is acting i'm like I wonder what's happening at home. That's what my mind first goes to, right? So uh, you, you know, you, we will we'll go more into some of it, but you know, the way that you have taken these experiences and how you have have become a creative, you were quoted in Forbes magazine's 2017 article saying that trans media will shape the future of Hollywood and Fortune 500 firms. Can you expand on that? And as far as like your creativity and what you've done and how all of these um, experiences have influenced, you know, what you do and how you do it. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you mean? Sure. Um, uh, the, the, um, the, 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 the darkest points in my life had been about a disconnection, had been about loneliness and isolation abandonment um and um uh and, and i i gradually taught myself that empathy that listening uh is um is a potential solution um uh, when i listen to people um particularly marginalized people um uh, uh, people of color um uh, people of of you know all kinds of different genders uh, 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 uh sexual persuasions and, and and so forth um uh, they bonded to me 
and um, and they became fans of my work, and um, uh, and and the the architecture for listening, I felt that was missing in mass media. Um, it, you know, the the TV ratings and box office numbers. Um, I, I felt that that wasn't enough, particularly when uh, stories and intellectual properties um, were destined to explode across multiple media platforms. Um, if you want to, to have a story world rather than a story, which manifests itself as movies and TV shows and video games and comic books and novels, um, uh, you're going to need uh, to listen carefully and validate and celebrate the participation of your audience. Um, how can you do that? In, in the 1980s and 1990s, there was almost no way uh, to, to really do that. I mean, sometimes a letter writing campaign helped to keep a TV show on the air. <laughs> um, but at the turn of the century, suddenly there was this capability to express ourselves and have the creators and the uh, owners of these stories and story worlds uh, able to listen to you, mm -hmm. whether they liked it or not. Um, so uh, a, a big part of my career was to create this interconnectivity, what I call transmedia storytelling, uh, uh, to be able to design stories so that they move across multiple platforms and so that the audience can get the feeling that they're a part of the story world, that they can participate in the story world and express themselves creatively and express their love for your story world to each other and to you. Um, uh, and, um, and somehow I managed to create a methodology uh, to do that uh, with, uh, with intellectual properties. Uh, I, I started with projects like Magic the Gathering and moved on to Hot Wheels and then Pirates of the Caribbean and Avatar and Transformers. And, um, and suddenly my, my career was, uh, you know, really taking off. And I was able to form uh, a, a company called Starlight Runner that does this for a living. That, and, it's in, and it's an incredible journey. It has been. I love hearing about the modality of reconciliation and how that's played into. You mentioned Avatar. And so many people love the movie Avatar. And if you haven't seen Avatar, anyone in the audience, I suggest after listening to this episode, you definitely go because you're going to have a deeper appreciation for it. Um, Jeff, tell me, because some people are like, what is modality of reconciliation? What does that even mean? And how does that play into a lot of the work that you do now? Or, how, or at least the, you know, the knowledge and awareness that you spread and the communities that you seek to heal? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Aliyah. Um, that that modality is is one of the most uh, important in my life. I think. Um, think about uh, the stories that we've enjoyed for all this time. Um, uh, generally, uh, they involve some kind of of big conflict, and the bigger the story, the bigger the conflict. So you have these heroes and villains clashing, and um, uh, and, and in doing so, there is this assertion of physical or psychological violence. And, um, and you know, when I was young, uh, of course, I thrilled to the spectacle of these conflicts. But there was always something deep inside me that wished that there were another way to resolve uh, these, these differences. Um, you know, um, it just was um, was something that emerged out of the fact that I personally experienced violence. I knew what it felt like to get hit. Uh, I knew what it felt like uh, to see uh, someone you love uh, become the, the victim of violence. Um, uh, do all our stories need to, uh, to, 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 to have this sort of thing? And if they do, how can we heal from them? Because in the movies and TV shows and, and even novels, um, uh, everyone just instantly recovered from uh, physical or, or psychological violence um, and, and kind of moved on. I didn't. <laughs> it, 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 you know, uh, those things haunted me and still do to, to this day. Um, uh, and that's often because 
uh, that violence was not accompanied by um, a, a resolution and a reconciliation. So um, uh, when I teach about bullying, but also when I teach, um, uh, when I talk to, to uh, movie executives, video game developers and, uh, um, and, and streaming services like Netflix or, or Disney Plus, I talk about how important it is um, that, that characters um, uh, reconcile. Um, uh, and that's, that's not to say that we forgive the bad guy and, um, and, and pat each other on the back when it's done, uh, but that we have to come to terms with one another um, and, and, and have to kind of, of uh, talk through uh, the, the trauma that was exchanged be, between each other. Uh, and that requires empathy. That requires a, a little extra beat after uh, the climactic uh, battle so that we can, um, uh, you know, to come to terms with each other. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I do. Um, I mean, I'm a survivor of multiple traumas and I know exactly. And often we have to give that to ourselves, the reconciliation, you know. So when you talk about it, it's it's definitely hits home and especially for our audience. When you were working on Avatar, I See You was a thing. And it wasn't until we had became acquainted uh, a couple months back when I was reminded of that and how beautiful that is. So tell me how you came to know what I See You means or how they do it in the movie or uh, how it's absolutely. related to the film. Sorry. Sure. Um, uh, you know, uh, Aliyah, first of all, uh, uh, let's pause to to think about my life. <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I was being given a bloody nose <laughs> in the um, uh, in the schoolyard across the street from the Baruch projects. <laughs> uh, flash forward, you know, twenty five or thirty years, and I'm standing on the set of Avatar, uh, uh, standing right next to James Cameron. Uh, assisting him with documenting and fleshing out the story world of Pandora and the future universe of Avatar. Um, I, I could not believe that this was the same life <laughs> that I was living. Um, and, and yet here, here I was. Um, uh, one of the jobs that we had uh, on Avatar was to... Um, come up with a kind of comprehensive, comprehensive compendium of, of the Navi. Uh, and that included their history, their culture, um, who they were, who they were going to be. And, um, and so we began to document this based on uh, the, um, uh, the script, but also based on what I was seeing just as the movie was being uh, shot, uh, the, uh, the production was, was getting underway. And one of the things that I was curious about was, uh, and, and I said, James, what, what does this mean when, when the characters say, I see you? Um, and, uh, and he looked at me and he smiled and he said, uh, I, I don't want to answer that question. I want you to ask the actors what they, uh, uh, what they mean when, uh, when their characters uh, uh, say that. And I did, and um, and it was wonderful because I got to talk to CCH Pounder and Sigourney Weaver, all of these wonderful uh, uh, performers, and each of them gave me a completely different uh, interpretation of of what that means. Um, but there were some threads that they all had in common, and I went back to Jim and and said, um, uh, it, it, could it be that uh, the Navi? when they encounter one another for the first time in a new day, that, that essentially they are encountering the whole, the, 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 the person as if they're encountering them for the first time, that the slate is kind of wiped clean. Um, and he said, where are you getting that from? And I said, well, um, uh, this whole philosophy of the Navi sounds kind of ontological. Um, and I had studied uh, everything from Toltec philosophy to Werner Earhart's forum, <laughs> Tony Robbins, <laughs> Dale Carnegie. Um, uh, there is a, a lot to be said for the notion 
of um, a, a, a truly neutralizing language and memory and giving the person that you're dealing with uh, a, a fresh start, a, a new chance, um, uh, the uh, ability for infinite possibility. And Cameron said, there you go. That's, um, uh, that's how I feel. And that's what happens when the Navi uh, tell, tell you, I see you. They right. see the totality of you, and yet we are starting absolutely new and fresh, and there's any possibility. Whatever conflict we had yesterday is gone, because here we are right now able to do anything. So in relation to the modality of reconciliation, how did those two kind of, you know, how did those end up being quite coincidental, I guess, is the word I'm trying to look for? Well, they're compatible. Yeah, compa there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yes. Um, uh, what, what happens is that um, uh, uh, through, well, look, let first, you know, in Avatar and in many stories, there is conflict. Right. Uh, in real life, there's conflict. And I'm not, uh, Aaliyah, I'm not advoc advocating uh, standing there and accepting uh, abuse, right. right? You have to understand your threshold, you know, um, the, the, um, the boundaries that you have as a person. And you cannot accept abuse that, that goes beyond those, those boundaries, right? Um, so you need to be prepared um, uh, to, to fight uh, or flight. You know, some of us don't have a choice right. um, because our environments are, are, are violent. So we need to learn how to defend ourselves. I'm, I'm, an, I'm actually an advocate of that. That's a little Cobra Kai, right? Right, um, right. Um, oh, oh, and, and, but of course, I, I prefer that you extricate yourself. You, right, you know, right. Uh, uh, try and get away. Yeah. All right. So, so um, uh, that's if there is active abuse happening right then and there. Um, uh, but after that, there is, there is this listening that I'm talking about, you, you know, trying, making an effort. We have to live sometimes with the people who, are, who can be bullies and, and who are bullying because, uh, you know, there's, uh, there can be problems right. uh, in, in that, where, they, where they come from. So understanding the context and 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 genuinely listening uh, uh, to this person, uh, it can be extremely helpful in pushing past these uh, uh, conflicts. That takes a little discipline, and there's some training. I, I do this training with young people uh, uh, sometimes with my Never Surrender program. Yes. And, and then there is this notion of finding a solution, um, and um, and our instinct sometimes is to assert our right on your wrong, right? Mm -hmm. That's what's happening on Facebook every single day. Right. I'm trying to assert my right on your wrong. You're doing the same thing. <laughs> and it's nerve wracking and, and awful. Uh, uh, but um, uh, sometimes we're capable of holding multiple ideas and contradictory thoughts in our minds at the same time. And if I do that, and you do that, it's more possible for us to generate a solution, a way to resolve our conflict. Um, so I call that third mind thinking. <laughs> um, it's your mind, my mind, and suddenly something can manifest in between the two that we both can kind of go, oh, that's cool. I, right. I, I'm, I, I'm up for that. And so are you. We can, uh, we've solved our, our, our differences, our difficulties. Right. But even still, we've, we've really pestered each other. We've bugged each other. We've annoyed each other, or worse, we've traumatized each other. So we need to, even though there is a solution, we hold grudges. We, we're, we're upset. We need to reconcile. So we need to have empathy with one another and talk through um, uh, the, the upset, the trauma, until it dissipates. And, and that's more than possible. It's doable. It's, it, it's, there's a, a great deal of historic uh, precedent for it. And it's what we do in the field when we do our, our transmedia population activations. Reconciliation is actually the key to avoid repeating the whole thing 
over again. That's important. And even if, you know, I think that when I, when I think about the modality of reconciliation and even just the concept of seeing people and, and taking that moment to say, I don't, I don't, I don't have any reason to be upset with you at this moment right now. Let's move forward or let's, you know, see how this goes. And I think even with the strangers, a lot of times people have preconceived notions, uh, whether it's a cultural notion, you know, I mean, it's, it, that, that happens. We know that. We know that when we talk about racial issues and social issues, they, those preconceived notions and, and things that need to be reconciled within our communities, it, it, you know, those things that you say speak to me and make me think of that as well, you know. Um, you you mentioned never surrender and i do want to give you an opportunity because you are a nationally recognized expert on leadership and success strategies excuse me success strategies for children and teenagers with an emphasis on how to overcome bullying in schools your international work on educational social issues and spiritual transmedia campaigns have benefited large geographical regions and even entire nations so never surrender tell us about it and tell us you know what that how, how that's how that's allowed you to really change and, and impact people's lives. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about Never Surrender, Aaliyah, um, uh, because of all the, you know, aliens and robots in my life, I, I rarely get to talk about um, uh, the, um, the educational work and the, the, the social good stuff that, um, that I do and I do with my team. Um, uh, Never Surrender is um, uh, it kind of emerged initially um, after I, uh, I I had left uh, the the projects the Lower East Side and I lived my life in in Flushing and went to college and uh, shortly after college I became a school teacher and um, uh, and and went back and taught in Bedford Stuyvesant Brooklyn and came to realize that after twenty years. Not much had changed. Um, uh, there was still uh, uh, violence, chaos, bullying um, in the classroom, in the schoolyard, and at the home of these uh, uh, children. And um, and although I felt I was doing, uh, you know, a little bit of good as a teacher uh, teaching in those classrooms, I, I really wanted uh, for my work, my stories, and and what I had learned. To um, uh, to be amplified and um, and get out into the world. So uh, I left teaching to do some game design and um, uh, you know uh, make my name in the entertainment industry. But I, I never forgot that vow uh, to um, uh, to to return uh, to young people um, who who are in the inner city, but also uh, in rural America. And all around the world, I've gotten to do this everywhere on the planet. Uh, and that's simply to, to tell my story and within the context of that story to also list the practical ways uh, that we can um, uh, transcend uh, uh, physical and emotional violence, uh, take leadership roles in our lives and, uh, and pursue our dreams. I'm the poster child for someone who has done uh, more, far more than I could ever imagine that I could have accomplished and, and do it with the things that I love. Um, that's not a miracle. That's strategy. <laughs> you know, that's, that's practical applications of the lessons that I learned from books and, and movies and TV shows. Um, uh, so I want to make sure that young people, uh, you know, get that opportunity as well. And the Never Surrender program is my way of doing that. What we, what's been one of the most significant stories of that journey? And I know I love how you, I mean, you specifically with helping someone, but I love how you said, like when they try to say, oh, somebody got in trouble, they can't be part of it. You're like, no, 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 I want those kids. I want to talk to the kids. So once again, when we talked about marginalized, like you talk about that, like people just, somebody acts up, throw them out, right? Like, oh, and, and that, that doesn't necessarily teach somebody something good either, right? You're just being taught that if I don't behave now, I'm just, I'm, I'm thrown off. I'm being rejected. And how can you not expect that behavior to just continue spiraling the issue, right? So Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Aliyah, to, to um, uh, put a finer point on what you just said, 
Um, it, it's strange how every single uh, Never Surrender seminar that I've given uh, at a school, I go to um, uh, the principal of the school and I say, well, this, uh, this assembly has got the whole school in it. And oh, yes, every kid in the school. I said, uh, I, I ask, I'll bet you that there are some kids who are not allowed to see the assembly. And, and they go, well, but they were bad. You know, um, uh, they behaved in an antisocial manner or they they bullied someone. So they're not allowed to uh, uh, to they don't get the privilege of seeing you perform today. And and I tell them, listen, the whole point <laughs> is for me to be able to to reach every kid, including those kids, especially those kids. Can you please bring them in? You know, and some of them stand their ground, Olia. Some of them say, no, they don't, they don't deserve to be with the rest. And I say, uh, give me 15 minutes with them. Then before the assembly, I'm going to go to their room and, and talk to wherever it is you're holding them. And, and sometimes they'll do that. They'll let me, uh, they'll let me talk to them. And, um, and, and when I do, um, the, the, uh, the, the deep empathy the 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 look on their faces when they realize that I've bothered to do that, it's precious, you, you know. And and uh, sometimes when they're a little older, like in high school, um, uh, they'll give me their email address or jump on my social media, and I've I've had friendships with these kids running, you know, uh, five, ten, fifteen years now. Right. Right. You know, when you talk about it, it reminds me of uh, a, an issue that I had one time with my son. He was, uh, he came home, there was a kid at school that was, he said, mom, you know, I guess he was a bit concerned because this kid was considered a bully and, well, he was a bully. He, he was, he definitely had some behavioral issues at school. And my son was nervous enough because I guess there was some threat that had been made against my some kids. This was right around the Parkland shooting that occurred. And so my son told me, the kid that's picking on me, mom, the principal once had to call the cops because he just walked around the school for three hours. And, and so, you know, so here was the thing. I called the principal and I said, you know, listen, I'm, I want to know, you know, what's happening. Is this a child that we need to be concerned about? If he's threatening the kids or my son, you know, is it true that you had to call the police on him? And I wasn't really trying to be nosy. I was actually more concerned than upset. And, and this is what happened. She says, well, I can't tell you that. And they said, OK, I understand that. Um, but let me ask you protocol. And if a kid comes home or a kid co goes to school and you find out he has lice and she says, well, the protocol is we let all the parents know he has that a child has had lice. And they said, so if this child needs help, if this child needs support from the community, which I'm saying I want to help, I don't want to you know, I want to be there. How are we ever going to be able to if you guys don't tell us what's happening and don't be honest right because I feel within the school system sometimes teachers think they have it all under control and they don't often have it under control and you know and so when you when you say that it just reminds me of my own you know stress and, and desire to say listen we want to help this kid as a community I don't I don't care that he was circling the school I don't villainize him because you had to call the cops on him but I want to know if you're also overlooking an issue that we should be concerned about and how can we support so you know everything that you do and this time that you spend going to help these kids I mean what have been some of the responses on what you do like you know 10 15 years later are you seeing them follow in, in the entertainment are you seeing like <laughs> uh sometimes the response is is from adults and it's not positive <clears throat> um you know, um, uh, the, the work that I do takes into consideration um, and humanizes the bully. Uh, there, there are some people who philosophically believe that, um, that we need to uh, construct peace bubbles <laughs> and, and that uh, there just should be um, uh, zones that uh, prevent uh, any kind of negative behavior, a kind of a zero tolerance. And if you defy it, you're out for good. And, um, uh, you know, that's okay if you're in a, a privileged society, I suppose. Um, but um, uh, the, the real world doesn't work that way. You know, there, there, 
tra trauma is is not easy. You you can't just you know create a zone <laughs> uh, that expels a, a a child that's been traumatized and therefore is passing trauma onto someone else. Right. Um, so. Uh, so I, I kind of argue with with those people and and um, and try to persuade them that different uh, uh, strategies need to be put into place to take those traumas into consideration and um, and and empathize and therapy uh, those young people uh, to get us to uh, to be able to reconcile and 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 live together. Um, uh, so there's there's been that. Um, uh, on the other hand. Um, uh, because the, the work that I do, um, uh, because of who I am, takes into account things like neurodiversity and, and the fact that um, uh, people's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, gender or, or preferences are across uh, an incredible uh, spectrum. You know, um, I've, I've had the... Um, the, the privilege of being able to, to um, uh, help young people who, who could have destroyed themselves. And, and some of them have come, uh, become artists and, uh, and I get to discover a, a, a couple of them and, and help to integrate them into, you know, um, uh, you know Marvel and DC comics or, or into Hollywood. And, and that's been hugely rewarding. That's incredible. I'm sure. Well, I'm sure by the time you're done, because you're just getting started, right? I feel like there's still so many, many more amazing projects in store. I know I look forward to working and continuing to collaborate with you. I know my husband looks forward to working and collaborating with you. Um, what is your call to action as we close up? You know, what's your call to action to society? You know, in general, right now, if you could, if you could ma wave a magic wand. What would what would be different? You know, there's um, there's this kind of concern on on kind of both sides of the political spectrum uh, that um, uh, we're, we're all becoming uh, uh, very obsessed with language and labels and um, uh, you know the the ability to to kind of eradicate each other through uh, uh, social media and um, and. I would, um, um, I, I try to communicate that we need to calm down, <laughs> that, that, um, that some of the upside of this controversy is that there is greater sensitivity to, um, uh, 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 to, to various perspectives. And that the fact that all of these perspectives exist simply means that we live in a rich, sophisticated system. So, so the call to action, um, uh, the request that I make of, of your audience is to, to stop looking at things in, in a polarized fashion, good, evil, um, uh, hero, villain, um, uh, you know, left, right, uh, and that sort of thing, because there's no such thing as just those things. Uh, there's, there's an array, an entire system and each of us represents a little dot uh, in, in that system. And we're all interconnected. And it's actually beautiful when we look at it. There are aspects of that system uh, that are flawed, uh, that, that are broken. Um, uh, sometimes they're flawed and broken because doing so benefits a very few uh, of, of those lights in, in the system, those little dots. Um, uh, we need to uh, uh, collectively, not one hero stepping forward to save us all. We have to save ourselves by collectively uh, 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 reconciling and, and, and repairing that system so that more of us can, can be okay. Uh, less of us can be traumatized. Um, so uh, if there are storytellers out there um, I, I would ask that you think of your stories this way. Um, uh, that's what I'm doing, and that's what I'm helping Hollywood to start to think about. Our stories are not the journeys of white saviors uh, coming to rescue us all. Uh, they are stories of entire communities that have to come together uh, to repair cracks and, and, and breaks 
in a uh, sophisticated system. And when we do, uh, all, more of us will live better lives and uh, we can get to the important work of reconciliation. I love that. I love that. I love that. I appreciate that. I think that that is just such an amazing and strong way to, to end the episode. We, we need to be the heroes, right? We all need to put on our capes <laughs> and we are the heroes. And what is our superpower and how can we use it to benefit society? Well, I know what yours is and I love you for it, Jeff. I thank you so much for being with uh -huh. us. Please quickly tell our audience the best way to get in touch with you or support you. Sure. Um, uh, follow me on Twitter at Jeff underscore Gomez. Um, uh, if uh, uh, it, it's uh, more uh, uh, business or industry oriented, uh, find me on LinkedIn, Jeff Gomez. Um, and if you want to see uh, 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 pictures of Ultraman and, and the other kind of nerdy, goofy things that I'm into, <laughs> follow me on Facebook, uh, Jeff Gomez. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for everything that you do and being such a supporter for Unsure Good Coded Media. We love you. We appreciate you. We hope to see you again. Okay. Thank you so much, Aaliyah, for this opportunity. It's been wonderful. Thank you. And to our audience, if you're not blown away, then I think you need to go back and listen. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for sticking around. We'll be back with another incredible episode next week. Until then, thank you for letting us be Unsure Good Coded. Mm -hmm.